All right. Those of you watching from home are not with us this morning. We miss you. <laughs> Those of you here, I'm glad you're here. It feels, still feels good as the numbers keep coming back. Hopefully, we'll be back to what we were before COVID all hit. But it's always good to meet together at least once a week, if not more. But we are in chapter 21 of the book of John this morning. Last week, we were in chapter 20. At the end of chapter 20, we are going to be in the first 14 verses of 21 this week. This is what it says. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they weren't able to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciples, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in a boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with the fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard, aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let's pray. Dearly Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, too, that not only did your son raise from the dead, but there is written record of him appearing to the disciples and many, many others a number of times so that we can see that it's not just stories but physical evidence was given that you have been raised and that our sins have been forgiven and that we will one day be with you. So we thank you for that. And we pray this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. So this is kind of a rhetorical question, but do you have any moments in your life where you can think back of when you were disappointed? Just like, man, you thought something was going to turn out differently than what it did. I, I, can think of, I can think of a couple of times in my life where that has happened. One time, when I was a kid, and usually like when you're, when you're a kid, things, disappointments, for some reason, stick in your mind longer than disappointments when you're an adult. Maybe it's easier to get over them when you're an adult. But anyway, the one time that stands out to me was, was a Christmas, Christmas gift. My brothers and I, we were longing and waiting for an Atari 5200. <laughs> I know the Velos and, and probably Kai, probably, yeah, you can yeah, understand. That, that was the upgrade from Atari 2600, and guess what, we got one. We got that Atari 5200, it was a great Christmas. We opened the package, all of our hopes and dreams had finally been met. We hooked up the thing to our little 13 inch color TV, and we started playing non-stop. It was a great day. <laughs> but suddenly, it stopped working. And no matter what we did, it wouldn't start working again. My dad decided the best course of action would be, okay, we'll take it back to the store and exchange it for a different one. Took it back, of course they were sold out. And this is about a time when Atari wasn't doing so well. And it was a store that was called Kitty City. I don't know if you guys remember that store. It was like a Toys R Us back in the day. But Kitty City was where we took it back. 
And so they, they try to say, hey, you know, for a little more money, we could give you an Atari 7800. My dad said, nope. So we went without any game system at all. So what Christmas that started out with as a dream coming true turned out to be the complete opposite. And I'm still waiting for the Atari 5200 till today. <laughs> Never forget those eight hours you played with it. But I, I believe that, that God, though, he allows disappointments to come into our lives, right? In fact, we could say that disappointments are God's appointments for us because he has something that he wants us to learn from these disappointments. But disappointments, especially if they're piled on one after another, they can turn into discouragements. And when we're discouraged, we can then feel defeated and useless. And this last year, I think, has left many of us disappointed for a number of things, let alone what a COVID has done to us. But first, let's talk about God's appointed disappointments. God allows disappointments to come into our lives. And we see that here with the disciples. And before Jesus reveals himself to the disciples, they, they are under the, the weight of discouragement. They feel they, they, they saw him outside the tomb, they saw him in the upper room, but still, it wasn't the same with being with him every single day as they were before his crucifixion. But there are at least three elements, right, that kind of make discouragement, disappointment, a pervasive problem, and I think it, it could be actually worse than a contagious virus. First, it's universal. Everybody gets discouraged or disappointed in their life at some point. We're all predisposed to discouragement, right? Everyone you have ever known has been discouraged. Even the happiest, go-lucky person you know, I guarantee they've been disappointed or discouraged at some point in their life. Secondly, it's recurring. Being discouraged once, while we can learn something from it, doesn't mean we're never going to be <laughs> discouraged or disappointed again, unfortunately. We're not immune to it. We don't build an immune immunity to it. This doesn't happen that way. In fact, you can even be down by the fact that you've been discouraged a lot. So it kind of becomes this snowball effect. Like, why am I always so down? I hate my life. And it just becomes this, this horrible snowball cycle. Thirdly, it's, it's highly contagious, right? Discouragement spreads, joy spreads, but discouragement also spreads. You ever been around a bunch of people that are always complaining and about everything all the time? It just sucks the energy out of you. And then you start thinking of all the negative things in your life and all the discouragements. You're like, yeah, you're right. Things are really bad. And then you get into that cycle yourself, right? So, so that's one of the reasons why as believers we need to practice joy, not by our circumstances, but by what God has done for us. Let's get into our text and see how we can deal with discouragement. And I see at least seven different points we have this morning of how to deal with disappointments and discouragements in our life. First, don't quit when you're discouraged. Don't quit when you're discouraged. I do a lot of running. One of my rules is when I'm running, if I'm going to take a break, I don't stop when I'm going uphill. It's a lot harder to restart. <laughs> You're going to take a break, take it at the top. But when, when Peter was feeling down, he wanted to go back and do things that, that he was used to. Let's, let's go back to fishing. <laughs> let's go do the things that we know how to do and that we're used to. But when they did, they found out that didn't work, right? They, they were discouraged. And I wonder if some of us are attempting to do the same things. Perhaps we're going through different hard times in our life right now. And we just say, you know what? I tried this Christianity thing. I think I had more fun in my previous life. Let's go back to that. Maybe you feel like people have maybe let you down and you just want to get away from everything. You're like, I don't want to go back to the world. I don't want to go back to the church. I don't want to, just want to get away from it all. Right? But Peter discovered the hard way that you can't go back. But God will get us through it. Several years later, Peter actually wrote in 1 Peter 5, 10, he says this, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, 
after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Peter's not writing this from an experience of going through constant struggles and discouragements, but being strengthened by God, and that promise is there. Now, God posed a question through the prophet Jeremiah to his people when they were considering to going back to how they once lived. He says this, why do you go about so much changing your ways? You will be disappointed by Egypt as you were by Assyria. You will also leave that place with your hands on your head, for the Lord has rejected those you trust. You will not be helped by them. That's in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 36, 37. Hey, don't go back. You might think it was better, but it really wasn't. You're going to end up worse than where you are right now. So I ask, are you maybe close to giving up? I don't know. I think we all can put happy faces and look good, especially on Sunday mornings. We can carry ourselves well, but maybe some of us are close to throwing a towel in. I'm going to say, with all that God has done for you, don't quit. For how much he loves you, don't quit. Keep serving him faithfully no matter what happens. And by serving him faithfully, it, it means serving him faithfully in your occupation, by doing a good one, in your marriage, by keeping faithful to your spouse and fulfilling what God has called you to do by being a good parent or grandparent. Look how God has called you to be good parents and grandparents to your kids and grandkids. Don't quit when discouragement hits. Secondly, only through Christ can we accomplish anything. Right? It, it amazes me here in this passage that there are at least three professional fishermen on this boat. It's not like some three guys were like, you know what, let's try fishing. Now, these guys knew what they were doing. They were fishermen before Jesus called them to have him follow for the last three years, and now they're kind of getting back to, into it. They might be a little rusty, but they know what they're doing. They knew how to fish. And first three puts the emphasis on the word that, so it would read, but that night they caught nothing. To not catch anything, that was very unusual. They weren't using a rod, right, a fishing rod and string. They were using a net, <laughs> like one of the easiest ways to fish. We should just swim to the thing and pull it up. And they caught nothing. After all, they, they had decided to go fishing to get rid of this feeling of discouragement. But Jesus was teaching them the truth of what he had said earlier in John 15, 5. says, apart from me, you can do nothing. They, they couldn't rely on their experience. They couldn't rely on their expertise. They thought to accomplish what they set out to do. They, like us, need to reaffirm Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. It's so easy to go through the motions, right? To go through what we know. I confess, I too have go, gone through the motions and continue to go through the motions at times instead of surrendering to God's spirit and saying, God, you lead me. It's easy for us to be fooled into thinking that we're somehow accomplishing something for God when in fact, our mediocrity must actually rise like a stench to God's nostrils. So we must stop meandering through the motions of this religious routine. We must stop this practicing what we think we know what we're doing. Let's allow times for disappointments to come into our lives, to, to, re, to reveal to us how easy it is for us to get bored with our faith, right? I mean, look, look at how, how quickly many people, how many people complained when we could no longer meet together or we had to wear a piece of cloth on our face and we thought, we can't have church like this. God's like, why? If a piece of cloth on your face disrupts your relationship with God, I would say you need to dig deeper. So when, when Jesus addressed the church 
at Ephesus in Revelation 2, he con commended them for their hard work and, and their perseverance. But then they had certain labor for, for Jesus, but then he points out something that was significantly wrong in verses 4 to 5. He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the same things you did at first. Brothers and sisters of Christ, have we as a church, have we forsaken our first love? And I ask that question as individuals and as us as a whole, as First Baptist Church. If so, let's repent. Let's get back on track. Let's refuse to settle for second best. Jesus, he doesn't tolerate anybody taking his place on the throne of your life. He needs to be there, no one else. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Jesus tells Peter that he is about to be spiritually fed. Says, Simon, Simon, Satan has, has asked to sift you as wheat. And I wonder if this time, this last year and continuing on, if this is a sort of spiritual sifting for us. And God's taking away the things that we thought were so important. He's saying, no, your relationship with me has weakened. Let me take away these things that you thought were important to have a relationship with me and rebuild that. And when we realize that our nets are empty, we then that's when we see that it's only God that can fill us. We'd also get to take comfort from the next verses. Jesus tells Peter that he will get through the trying times because the Lord himself is praying for him. He says, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, you strengthen your brothers. That's Luke 22. You can find that. Thirdly, the best choice is always obedience. Always. In verse 5, we see Jesus gently calling out to his disciples, greeting them as friends, or literally, dear children, as he asked them how the fishing is going. <laughs> I don't know how the disciples didn't reply back more sarcastic. Maybe they're too, too tired. But he, he wants them to admit the obvious fact that, that they caught nothing, right? Jesus knew that they didn't catch anything. He's like, hey, how's that going out there? Did you catch anything? No. And so John uses the exact phrase in 1 John chapter 2, verse, chapter 2, verse 13. He says, I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. And this term of endearment, it kind of reveals, though, that Jesus loves us even when we're going astray. See, Jesus' love for us doesn't change even when our relationship with him, we're not pursuing him or we're doing things in our own means and our own routine. Jesus still loves us. He, he sees our empty net and he wants to fill it. He changes us, though, through obedience. When we decide to obey him, no matter how we're feeling, no matter what we're doing, no matter how empty our nets are, no matter if it makes sense or not, he is honored by our obedience to him. And that's what we live for, to honor and obey God. In Jeremiah chapter 42, verse 5, God's people make a commitment to obey. It says, whether it is favorable or unfavorable, we will obey the Lord our God. That's what he wants from us. Whether it's culturally acceptable or no longer culturally acceptable, we need to obey what God has commanded us to do. And that's exactly what the disciples did when Jesus told them to throw the net on the right side of the boat. They didn't make, didn't make much sense. Like, what do you, it's, have you seen a fishing boat? It's not that wide. We're we talking about that side compared to this side. All right, let's stop. we'll do it. But they chose to obey. I said, okay, we'll throw it to the other side. In C.S. Lewis' book called The screw Shaped Letters, um, C.S. In his book, he, he imagines this dialogue between a, uh, a devil, a demon, and, and this young, young apprentice. And it says this, and he's teaching him basically like, this is how you attack God's children, his, his followers. And it says this, it is during the tough periods, much more during the peak periods, hence the prayers offered in the state of dryness are those that please him, I'm talking about God best. He wants them to learn to walk and must therefore take his hand away. And if only the will to walk is really there, he is pleased even with their stumbles. 
Do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks around the universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. And so he's telling his young apprentice, hey, you know what? He's just Christians. You gotta really worry about him when God allows him to fall and isn't there to pick him up, and the Christian still obeys, like Job did. That's when we have to worry about it. Right? It's then that we must honor and obey God, for it is our obedience where God then reveals himself to us. Fourthly, blessings are just around the corner. Right? The difference between the empty net and a full one was the width of a boat. Jesus kept the fish from swimming into the nets during the night, and now he's going to send a whole school of large fish right into this net where he wants them to go. And Psalm chapter 30, verse 5 chapter says, We may remain for a night, but rejoicing, we be may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. We can't fish the blessings out of our life, but we can catch what God sends our way. The disciples, in their own strength, they came up completely empty. Not one thing was caught. Not like, well, I did this much. Nothing. But when they obeyed, God sent his blessings. And when God blesses, he does so abundantly. As Ezekiel 34, 26 states, I will send down showers in season. There will be showers of blessing. See, Jesus still watched over them. He still loved them when they were catching nothing. But when he said, put it over there, have something for you, they obeyed and they were able to catch what they were looking for and more than they thought. Fifthly, it's worth letting go and running to Christ. I love how John was the first to, to recognize Jesus. Maybe that's because of all the disciples, it was John who stayed while Jesus was hung on the cross. The love for his master was, was never really questioned, and Jesus had a special plate in his heart. As they're wrestling with the net, though, John turns to Peter and says, It's the Lord. All right, and verse 7 says, As soon as Peter heard this, Peter then grabbed his garment that he had off him. He jumped into the water and ran. He said, I'm not going to wait until this boat gets to the shore. I'm going to run to the shore. And while Jesus performed the first fish miracle in Luke 5, Peter wanted Jesus to depart from him. All right, it says, I'm unworthy to be here. But now, Peter's jumping out into the lake and running to Jesus when he first sees him. And in Matthew chapter 14, verse 28, Peter asks, is it really you? And right now, he doesn't need to have confirmation. He knows, it says, not one of the disciples dared to ask because they knew it was a Lord. I, I love this about Peter, though, right? He doesn't let anything stop him. He doesn't let anything come between him and seeing his Savior. While he certainly still had some guilt and shame, he knew that Jesus would f fully forgive him. So I ask, will you do whatever it takes to get close to Jesus? Will you run out into the waters of life knowing that Jesus is there to get you? We can't be passive about our spiritual walk with Christ. Spiritual growth only happens when we become disciplined to read our Bibles, to pray fervently, to worship with other believers, to serve others, and to fish for the souls of people. We must take action. Proverbs 8, verse, chapter 18, verse 10 tells us that the Lord will protect those who run to him for shelter. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Ask, will you run to the Redeemer every day? I don't know how disappointed or discouraged or disillusioned you are today, but I do know that you are as close to Jesus as you want to be. So it's time for us to get out of the boat, get out of our safety, jump into the water, and pursue our Savior. Sixthly, only by God's grace are we able to achieve anything? 
My, one of my favorite verses of this passage is verse 10, where it says, bring some of the fish you have caught. Now, Jesus, he was already frying some fish there on, on the shore and, and has some bread baking, but he invites them to share what they have. But what's very interesting is that Jesus asked them to bring fish that they have caught. The disciples, they knew they didn't do anything. They were out there all night. They didn't catch a thing, right? But it, it was Jesus that brought that fish into their net. And they did as they were told to do by putting the net on the other side of the boat, on the right side. This is a great lesson for us to remember, though. While we may do something for the Lord, it is all by his grace. See, we really can't do anything. And yet, we often take credit for those things that go well in our lives, right? And in our church, right? We also measure our church success by how many butts are in the seats and how much money's in the offering plate. And that's not a good measurement, but it's also not by anybody's power. God allows that to happen. He doesn't allow it to happen. But what's awesome, by God's grace, he allows us to participate in these blessings and partner with him in his work in the world. And that's amazing to me. This is nothing that I do. We are just his vessels, and he uses me as he sees fit. So we need to make sure we are, we are free from pride because it has some ugly consequences. One of the things I learned often, I am discouraged, disappointed in things in my life, mainly because of my pride, <laughs> right? That's usually the root cause of it. Sometimes it is, but that's mainly what it, what it is. Proverbs 11 verse two tells us, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. It's amazing how many times I see leaders fall after I see their pride rise up higher and higher and higher. The difference is when the world wants to see you fail so that they can make fun of you. God wants to see you fall so that he can use you greater, bring you into his grace all the more. The disciples couldn't high five each other here, right? They couldn't celebrate, yeah, look at all these fish that we caught. They were like, yeah, we are just the greatest fishermen since then after, after three years. No, they knew. <laughs> after all night, we got nothing. This is all because of Jesus filled our nets. Daniel chapter 4, verse 37 says, And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Then Hosea chapter 13, verse 6 reminds us how easy it is to take credit and become spiritually lethargic and proud of our own accomplishments. As when I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. And James chapter 4, verse 6 it puts it strongly and succinctly, which says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. How many of you guys have felt almost, you, you, don't, you don't feel as, as urgent to turn to God when things are going well in your life, right? Like I must be doing something right. All my bills are paid, I'm healthy, whole family's healthy, things are fine. Yeah, yeah, thank you, I'm doing, I'm doing good. Right? And then we judge someone else as, oh, if only they were listening to God, maybe, maybe they'd be doing better. Right? God says, oh, really? He knocks you off your high horse. But it's okay. It's for us to grow. He does it because he loves us. I've had to learn a lesson many, many times. Why? Because of our seventh point. And our final point for this afternoon or this morning. Jesus loves to rebuild what's broken. He loves it. Because the emphasis in this passage, right, while we could be amazed by the miracle of the fish swimming into the net, it's not really about the fish. The emphasis on this passage is about the fishermen. 
They needed to be restored. And the only way that that was going to happen was through spending time with Jesus. Nothing they could do on their own would make them feel, feel whole again. Look at verse 12 and 13 again with me. As Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask, who are, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This is similar to the one Jesus gave in John chapter 7, verse 37, where it says, come to me and drink. He would recognize, here Jesus recognized that they labored they were all night. They were cold. They were hungry. And so he now invites them to breakfast. Jesus knew that they needed to have their, their physical needs met, right, before he could minister to their, really, their, their, their deeper needs. And as a side note, that's, I think, why we need to approach ministry holistically as well. Right? Jesus always met someone's physical need before he met their spiritual need. And too often, I think, we're so focused as a church on someone's spiritual need and the person is hungry and they don't have clothing or they're cold in their house and we're not meeting their physical need. And they say, well, what good is your Jesus if they can't even meet my need here on this earth right now? So let's keep that in mind. We want to reach somebody for Christ. Let's emulate what Jesus did. It is as, as, if, as if Jesus is, is giving them time just to sit and, and enjoy his presence. As they eat, their, their failures fade away. Right? You kind of you forget that. And that's one of the, the beauties, I think, of coming together here, meeting together. Right? We're all in the same boat together, and we realize we're all sinners, but look at us. We're all in God's presence together. We're all enjoying that grace and forgiveness, and it really encourages you and grows you. But as they eat, they, they feel that go away, and his forgiveness begins setting in. And in this setting, the disciples didn't have much to say because they're, they're in awe. They get to see Jesus again. They come to the shores of God's amazing grace and were invited back into fellowship with him and rest restored into community with one another. In short, Jesus wanted them to be at peace with him and with each other. Go back to verse 2 for a moment. As John tells the story, he lists Peter, and then right after him, we read about Thomas. Thomas learned a hard way not to live in isolation. From here on, though, he lives in community with the disciples. You see him join with everybody else. And so, too, we need to be with other believers. Maybe not every day, but at least a couple of times a week. And we certainly need to wait on the Lord. This passage reminds that Jesus is also waiting on us. He's on the shore right now. He's inviting us to sit down with him. He's inviting us to be restored, to have a relationship reconciled. He wants to rebuild our broken lives. The empty net reminds us that he's not finished with us yet. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, 6 says, Being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He promises that. He's going to see what he started in us. His good work will be completed. He is Jesus Christ, God, Son, and Savior, risen from the dead. And because he's alive today, he can deal with any disappointments that you may have. He loves to make himself known when you are most at loss. Will you come to him this morning? Will you respond to the invitation? Whether you have a relationship as disciples did and need to be restored, or whether you never had a relationship, respond now. As we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, meditate on these last verses. God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to redeem it. Just as he invited the disciples to eat and drink, he invites us now at this table. Let this be a reminder to us of not just the price he paid, but 
why he paid the ultimate price. It's not about the elements. It's about our relationship being restored with him so we could have fellowship with him once again, so that we could live our lives for the purpose he intended for us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, again, just for all that you have given to us so much. We know that you, there was nothing in our lives that you haven't given to us. Lord, I pray for those that are here that might be battling disappointments and discouragement or anything that's bringing them down. I pray you would use us, each other, that we could encourage one another. Lord, too, but I also pray that if the relationship has, feels fractured from you, that it would be restored. Lord, that they would pursue you. They would jump out of their boat, lift their garment, and meet you on the shore of life, Father. And be in your presence and know that you love them. Father God, let's not always fight these disappointments, but let's understand that you have oftentimes allow them to come into our life so that we can grow, so that we can see that we truly are your vessels and tools to be used by you and your glory. Lord, we thank you for that honor. We thank you for that privilege to be called sons and daughters of you, Lord. Lord, as we get ready to partake in the elements, Lord, take communion this month. I pray that you would prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, that we will not just celebrate, but that we would know what you did, Father God, the price that you paid. And let us never take that for granted. And I pray this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. <music>